There is no consensus definition of populism, but most scholars these days work what is within what is called the ideational approach, in which populism is primarily seen as a set of ideas. And these ideas are centered around an opposition of the good people and the bad elite. Now, I personally use a definition of populism that sees it as an ideology that considers society to be separated into two homogenous and antagonistic groups, the pure people versus the corrupt elite, and which argues that politics should be an expression of the volonté générale or the general will of the people. Within this definition, there are three key aspects. First, I see populism as an ideology, unlike other people, which means that for me, it is more than just a strategy to gain power. It is a kind of worldview that then later also informs policies. Sec second, it is monist, which means that the key categories are seen as homogenous. The people are seen as one group who all share the same interests and values. Similarly, the elite are one group with all the same interests and values. And finally, the distinction between the people and the elite is moral. So it's a moralist ideology where the distinction is not between the wealthy and the poor or class-based, no, the people and the elite are based, are separated on the basis of their morals. The people are pure of mind and the elite are corrupt. At the heart, populism is explained by the inherent tension within liberal democracy. Liberal democracy is the system that we have and generally we will call that democracy. But democracy in the simplest form is a combination of popular sovereignty and majority rule. The system that we actually have is liberal democracy, where popular sovereignty and majority rule are combined with other aspects, such as minority rights, rule of law, and separation of powers. Now, there is an inherent tension between majority rule and mi minority rights. Sometimes, a majority wants to do things, but that infringes upon the rights of the minority. Think, for example, about the banning of bosques or of veils. In some countries, a majority of the country wants to do that, but within our system, we don't allow that, at least not the banning of mosques, because it's religious freedom and that right protects even religious minorities. Now, in today's political context, you could see populism as an illiberal democratic response to undemocratic liberalism. And let me explain that. So populism is an illiberal democratic form. It is democratic in the sense that it does support popular sovereignty and majority rule. But it's illiberal because it doesn't believe in minority rights, rule of law, separation of power. It responds to undemocratic liberalism, which is on the one hand, simply stated, the neoliberal system of economics, as well as of by and large government, in which power has moved away from the electoral arena into unelected areas like central banks and all kinds of committees. On top of that, we have an increasing um, constitutionalization or legalization of a lot of issues. So take issues like the death penalty, which has also been taken out of the electoral arena and are now simply considered illegal because we have signed international treaties. And so over the last several decades, we have moved away, we have moved a lot of our decisions away from the electoral arena into either the courts or <clears throat> expert committees and institutions, which has undermined in a sense, the power of the people, the power of the majority. 
And so this is very simply stated what's at the core of populism per se. Now, with regard to practical application and examples of populism, it is important to remember that populism can be left or right or even centrist or completely idiosyncratic. Populism is what we call a thin-centered ideology, which means that it is an ideology, but it speaks to only a small part of the broader political agenda. Very simply stated, populism does not tell you exactly what economic system to have, for example, how much redistribution, things like that. Consequently, in most cases, populism comes together with another ideology, what we call the host ideology, which can be socialism on the left and often is nationalism on the right. Now, if you think about some left-wing populist parties, you can think about Syriza in Greece, PSUV in Venezuela, or the Occupy movement. If you think about the right, you can think about Marine Le Pen, Bolsonaro, Trump. What type of policies do populists generally implement? They try to strengthen the executive, in many cases the president, but sometimes also the government. And they undermine the independence and power of the judiciary and the media. And some of the best examples of this can be seen in Venezuela and Hungary today. There has been an explosion of research on populism in the last five years, but it has been very much focused on a few aspects. There is very good research and a lot of research, for example, on the electoral success of populist actors, populist parties. There's a lot of research on populist rhetoric. However, we still do not know too much about the consequences of populism on the political system and on society. For example, most populist actors will attack the legitimacy of the system and of the pro-system parties of the media, of the judiciary. While they do this in opposition, this might not have policy effects, but it could undermine the trust of the majority of society in those key institutions. We do not know that yet. Also, we don't exactly know yet what the specific effect of populism is vis-a-vis -vis the host ideology. So take, for example, right-wing populist parties, which often combine nationalism with populism. Now, are these parties mostly supported because they're anti-immigrant or are they mostly supported because they're anti-elite? Or do people at the individual level actually not distinguish between the two? I think this is, these are things that we should study more. There are a lot of really great books on populism and on specific populist parties or populism in specific countries and regions. But I have chosen four books. The first is a classic already, which is Jan Werner Müller's What is Populism, which was published in 2016. It is an argumentative introduction really to populism with a specific focus on Europe. The second book is by Ruth Wodak, The Politics of Fear, which was published initially in 2015 and has a newer edition out last year. In The Politics of Fear, Ruth Wodak shows how populists use fear in their rhetoric. And it's really a hands-on guide to understanding populist rhetoric. The newest book that I recommend is by Benjamin Moffat, one of the young stars of populism studies, which is simply called Populism, and which is a more political philo philosophical introduction to populism with from different approaches, really giving a great overview of both the study of populism and the practice of populism. And then finally, book by Chantal Mouffe for a left populism. Now Chantal Mouffe, together with her late husband, are the proponents of a different view of populism, which is also still very important within the study of populism, where populism is seen as positive 
but also defined a little bit looser. And her book for a left populism is really kind of the pamphlet for that type of politics. It was published in 2018.